So here we have the derivatives of sine and cosine. The derivative of sine is cosine. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. So you, can you see yourself having a tough time remembering which one's which because they're the opposite, but one's negative and one's positive. So I find the best way to remember which one goes with which is to actually think about their graphs. So I've got a graph of sine right here and a tangent. Yeah, if you remember what the sine graph looks like, that's important. So here's the graph of sine. And if I start right at zero and draw a tangent there, the first thing I want you to notice about that tangent line is that its slope would be positive. And because that slope is positive, and in this case it's perfectly positive one, as I drag this, it stays positive, it stays positive till here and then goes negative. And you can see that it makes a positive coast graph. And the fact that it starts off with a positive slope is one of the things that helps me remember that the derivative of sine is positive cos. Whereas if we look at the derivative of cosine, it starts off right at zero. But as soon as I go to the right, can you see that your tangents are going to be negative? And it's got to be in the negative right away in that first little bit. And the only, if we drag this along here and draw the graph, you can see, sure enough, it makes a sine graph, but it makes a negative sine graph. So again, I think about my coast graph, I think as I go move that point along my coast graph, my slopes will be negative right away. And so for me, that helps me remember that my derivative of cos is a negative sine. Because otherwise, it's really easy to mix them up. Especially later on, when we work backwards, when we work backwards, the integral of sine is negative cos, and the integral of cos is sine, and it's just going to get mixed up where the positive and negative go. So you need to have some sort of reasoning or some sort of idea of where the negative goes and why. And I find that the graphs really help us see that. So then we can do all sorts of derivatives now with all the rules we've had so far with sine and cos added to that. Now one of the things that I find sometimes difficult is the notation with sine and cos when you have a power of 4 or a power of 2. When you're writing sine to the power of 4, you write the 4 in between the sine and the x. This means the same thing. as this. But mathematicians don't like writing brackets. They find that that's tedious and takes too much time. So they've got notation which allows you to put that 4 on in between the sine and the x. But this is a chain rule and you have to be able to see that your outside function is the power of 4 and that sine of x is an inside function. And so when we're doing the derivative, with the chain rule, you do the derivative of the outside function first, multiplied by the derivative of the inside function, and the derivative of sine is cos. So this could be written like this. But you may find you like to change the notation so that you can really see what's your outside function and what's your inside function for chain rules. Here we have another chain rule. Okay? Now, Again, one of the things that just comes with practice is being able to recognize what's an inside function, what's an outside function. And the way that I sort of visualize it myself is I sort of go to hug my function. And <laughs> when I'm coming from both sides, when I hug my function like this, I go, what is the first function that I run into when I hug it like this? In this case, I'm going to hit the cos first. In the last example, when you come, the power of 4 gets hit first. Because if you're coming from both sides, so that's, I, I don't know, that's not 
normal mathematical terminology, but I love math, so I like that. You know, okay, I'll go hug my functions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just, just hug your function, feel nice and close to it, and then you can see what's on the outside. So here, when you're coming from the outside, the first function that gets is your cos. So when doing the derivative, the derivative of cos is negative sine. So it'll become a negative sine. And with the chain rule, you don't change the inside function. And then you multiply by the derivative of the inside function. So this is going to take a lot of your mental focus now that we're adding some other functions to really see what we've done. All we did to begin with was the derivative of cos is negative sine. So the derivative of cos 3x cubed would be negative sine 3x cubed. And then you still have to do your chain rule because the 3x cubed has a derivative, so you'd multiply that afterwards. The 4 in front doesn't affect anything. We also have to be able to recognize here there's no product rule. Okay? I mean, it is, it is 4 times cos, but that 4 isn't a function. It's just a coefficient. If, it, if you use the product rule in this one, it wouldn't be wrong, but it would be a little bit redundant because all you would have for 1 is when you do the derivative of 4, you get 0, and it just sort of wastes that whole space. Like you've done a whole bunch of extra writing for nothing. And then the second part where you keep the 4 the same derivative of the second is basically just doing the derivative directly to begin with. Your turn. But we can check if you got the right side right. You just have to do one extra thing. This is implicit differentiation. So the derivative of sine is cos. And then you would have dy dx on the left side. So that's implicit differentiation. And on the right side, it just has things with cos. We do have a product rule here. So keep one the same, multiplied by derivative of the other one, plus keep the other one the same, multiplied by the derivative of the first one. So hopefully you can check, did you get the right-hand side correct? And then to get dy dx by itself, You'd have to divide both sides by cos of y. There's just one extra thing, but it's scary looking. So check. How did your right-hand side go? It's a pretty straightforward product rule, but now that we've got sine and cos in there, in the textbook, most likely, an x to the, a 3x to the 6th would be factored out. Just like your textbook, kind of looks like an identity. It's not quite an identity, but we're doing a derivative, and we want that derivative to end up matching cos of 2x, so it becomes, it becomes an identity after you've done the derivative. So to start off with, this is a product rule, because we have a multiplication right there. And so our derivative will be keep one the same, derivative of the other one, plus keep the other one the same, derivative of the first one. And when you multiply this all out, you get cos squared x minus sine squared x, which was one of your identities from grade 12. Of course, you don't have a formula sheet now. 
Well, you, you can, you're always using an identity to prove an identity. At some point you have to. So I can either directly go from here, co squared minus, co squared minus sine squared to give me cos 2x. So you are allowed any of the identities that you had from grade 12, the grade 12 course, you're allowed to say this is equal to that. Generally, the ones that came, come up are the, these ones, the ones sine squared plus cos squared equals 1. Okay? The double angle identities come up a fair bit. Not so much with tan, but with sine and cos. Those ones come up more often. The alpha plus beta ones and the, the sum and difference identities, not so much. Perfect. <laughs> oh, okay. Try this one. It's not so. No implicit differentiation. Chain rule the outside function is cos. So when you're hugging this function, you'd hit this, the cos first. The derivative of cos is a negative sign. Don't get over eager, right? You just do one derivative at a time. So then the inside stays the same, and then you multiply by the derivative of the inside. Next one. And on this one here, I would take that 1 over the square root of x and change it to an x to the minus a half. Gradient function is another name for the derivative. Using the quotient rule, keep the bottom the same. Derivative of the top, the derivative of the top function is a chain rule. Derivative of cos is negative sine, keep the inside the same, and then you still have to remember to multiply by 3 because the function inside is 3x and it has a derivative. Minus, keep the top one the same, and then the derivative of the bottom function. Again, it's a chain rule. Derivative of sine is cos, then the derivative of x to the negative half is negative half x to negative 3 halves. All over the bottom squared. Yes? Okay, everybody good on this one? Okay, here's the last one that we did. Good? Okay, so now next one is the derivative of tan, and we want to show that it's secant squared. So let's look at the tan graph. Okay? The interesting thing about the tan graph, if you look at it, can you see that the slopes of any tangent to a tangent graph are always positive? So even when you switch over to the next one, they stay positive there. And they sure look like the graph of secant, but in order for them all to be positive, it ends up being secant squared. Well, we had to graph secant. We didn't have to graph secant squared. There's a little bit of a different shape. It looks the same, but yeah, if I would graph y equals secant x on the same one, just to show you it's not quite the same shape. There. So you see how secant squared is narrower than secant, which yeah, if you're just sketching it, it's very similar. Have asymptotes in the same place. Yeah, maybe. So how do we figure out that the derivative is secant squared? All we have right now for tan is we can use identity. We know that tan is sine over cos. And then you could use your quotient rule. Keep the bottom the same derivative of the top plus keep the top the same 
the derivative of the bottom, which I missed a minus sign here, right? Subtract derivative of the bottom all over the bottom squared. Well, what does this do on the top? On the top, we get cos squared plus sine squared. You can use your identity. You remember that cos squared plus sine squared is equal to 1. So now you can either, every time you get tan in a question, which does come up a fair bit, you could do this long route every time, or you could just remember that the derivative of tan is secant squared or 1 over cos squared. There's a couple here for you to work backwards. I'll put up the answers in a second. How are you doing this first one? You ready? No, not quite. That you didn't have to do the plus C because it just says you could have any number plus 15 at the end, right? 15 is the number of the year. And the next one? Again, the hardest part with these, whether working in one direction or the other, is whether or not that negative has to be there. Since the derivative of sine is cos, if you would need to get a negative cos, you needed to have started with a negative sign. So here's what we deduced. We figured out that the derivative of tan was secant squared. And now we'll use this to do a whole bunch of questions that, oh, I don't want to show you the answer for that one yet, whole bunch of questions with tan. So here's your first tan question, and I want you to work actually on the next three to the end of the page. product rule. So you keep one the same, derivative of the other one, then keep the other one the same, derivative of the first one. That's it. The product rule and the chain rule. So one of the things you have to look for is something inside of another function. So here, the tan x is a function by itself. Yeah. x squared plus 1 is another function by itself. Those two are multiplied together, so we have a product rule. Again, since we can have so many different functions and so many different arrangements, it takes practice just to get used to what's a product rule, what's a chain rule. That would be a chain rule, yeah. Then, well, but that's not the derivative yet, that's just an identity. Okay, I'll get ready for the next one. Yes, that's fine. Yeah, you could use a quotient rule here. In this case, I would probably take 
the time, whenever I have 1 over something, I found that power rule is easier, even if you have a quotient rule there. And so I changed that 1 over tan x to tan x to the negative 1. Now that negative 1, don't really like putting it in there in this case. I can really show that it's a function on the outside. Notation-wise, here's also a little bit messy because tan to the minus 1 could also imply an inverse function. So here in particular, I like to have the minus 1 on the outside, not to confuse it with the inverse function. The first one is a chain rule. And when you're hugging that function, you would hit tan before you hit the two x's inside of tan. So you would have secant squared, and the 2x stays inside of there, multiplied by the derivative of the inside, which is multiplied by 2. Second one is also a chain rule. But the outside function is your negative 1, your power rule. So negative 1 comes in front, subtract 1 from the exponent, and then keep the inside the fun of function the same, and then multiply by the derivative of the inside function. So what we're doing to your brain is we keep adding more, keep the rules the same, but add more things that you have to play with. And we're pressing your brain to manage all of that. So we're, yeah, we're trying to find when does it break. It's already broken. Implicit differentiation here. So bring the 2 out in front and then multiply by y prime. On the other side, we have a chain rule. Sometimes that when it's just a 7x inside, sometimes that chain rule is a little bit harder. So derivative of the outside function, which is tan, is secant squared. The inside stays the same. Then multiply by the derivative of the inside function. Solve for y. Notation-wise, it's nice to write this 7 out in front so you don't get it confused and think that I should multiply the 7x times the 7. And there's our derivative. All right. So we have a chain rule, but now we're just dealing with trig functions here. So what is the derivative of tan of sine x? This is a chain rule. Can you see the difference between this and this? This would be a product rule. This one, the sine x, is inside of the tan. <laughs> All right, so here's our derivative. Outside function is tan. Derivative of tan, secant squared of sine. Derivative of sine is cos. Easy. No, we're not working backwards. There's no plus 15 in this one. Right, you'd have to have a plus 15x in order to get your 15. Should have designed every question from, not, from now on with a plus 15x so we could always get 15 in every answer. OK. First, if you're going to, you want to try this one on your own? First, I would, I would first, and 
I would do that first because no reason to use the quotient rule if you have a constant on the top of your fraction. You can. It's not wrong if you do, but it's Eh, it's just, you're going to get zero on one side, you're going to get bigger numbers than you need. And I also notice here, I wrote the power of five outside, so you could really see that that was your most outside function. The 6x is inside of sine, and the sine is inside the power of negative five. So here we're going to have a chain rule twice. And no matter how many things you have inside of other things, the chain rule says just do one simple derivative at a time. Do the derivative of the outside and keep the inside the same. And then when you do the derivative of the inside, you keep that process continuing. So our outside function is the power rule. That negative 5 would come out in front. The inside would stay the same subtract 1 from the exponent, multiply by. We have to do the derivative of sine 6x. Now that's another chain rule. So the derivative of sine is cos, keep the inside the same. And now we have to do the derivative of the inside there, times 6. You want this in brackets? That make you feel better? There we go. Oh, he wants the, you want the 6x inside of brackets there. Okay. Good? So when you have multiple chain rules, that's all you're doing as you come around, go along. Sure, you can try this one. What's that? Yeah, find the derivative of tan cubed of x with respect to x. There's no y in this equation. The proper, the proper way to write this out with an equal sign would look like that. If you wrote dy dx, I'm not going to dock you on notation. Okay? Um, equal to 3 tan squared x secant squared x. Again, now I, I didn't change my notation. I just went to the answer directly. And this can cause some problems. So I'm going to take this part here. I'm going to lower it down. And I'm going to first think about bringing that 3 out in front like this. Okay. That can really help you see that I brought the 3 out. I kept the inside the same. What's the derivative of my inside function? Secant squared x. And then maybe you can change it back to that notation if you'd like. But again, that notation of where you place powers inside of trig functions can sometimes throw you off. So if you wanted to change the tan, cubed x to tan x cubed to start with, if that helps you, that's fine. We can also do questions that we've done in the past. Find the equation of a tangent line at a certain point. The origin is 0, 0. Well, 
What do we need to find an equation of a tangent line? We need a point, which we've got. We also need the slope of the tangent line. In order to find the slope, our derivative gives us all the slopes. At x equals 0, what is cos of 0? 1. So we also have to know our unit circle and all the values from grade 12. So at 0, y prime is equal to 1. So now we've got our point. We know our slope. What line has a y-intercept of 0 and a slope of 1? y equals x. Which, if you think back to our sine graph, we had that right here. That red line, does it make sense that that red line is y equals x? More identities. <laughs> Can you rearrange this one so that your answer looks like that? Step one, let's just do the derivative like normal. So we would have here a chain rule, power rule first, bring the three out in front, subtract one from the exponent, Derivative of the inside, which is sine x, would be cos x. Again, feel free to change the notation to sine x all cubed if that helps you see it better. Next, derivative of sine x is cos x, so we just have minus 3 cos x. Now, to move to the next step, when we want our derivative to match up with this, and right now this is all multiplied. And what we have has some adding and subtracting. One of the key things that you look for, is there a way that I can factor out something? In particular, is there a way that I can factor out something that matches up with what I have here? In this case, I'm looking at the minus 3 cos x. And I have a minus 3 cos x here. I could take out a 3 and a cos x. I could even take out a negative. That would just make the first part negative. So factoring out that minus 3 cos x leaves me with minus 2 sine squared x plus 1. And 1 minus 2 sine squared x is cos 2x, right? So even if you've forgotten your identities on the exam, at this point, if you don't remember that 1 minus 2 sine squared is cos 2x, you just write it and say, I hope I did things right up till now, because that's the only way it could work. <laughs> <Don't>. <laughs> what not to do is to start the question and go, I have no idea, and just write the answer that you're supposed to find with no work shown whatsoever. <laughs> yes, yes. You have to know your identities. Yes. Okay. If you've got this one, try the next one. It's another double chain rule. So again, you may choose to write this one like this, and then your derivative, I guess it's f of x, not y, derivative of the outside function, that 4 would come out in front, leaving you with tan of 2x cubed, multiplied by the derivative of the inside function, which is secant squared, and keep the 2x the same multiplied by the derivative of 2x is 2. Yeah. 
So in addition to learning sine, cos, and tan, there's our other trig functions. Again, you can either have these memorized or you can just derive them because you can change cosecant to 1 over sine and use the quotient rule or sine of the negative 1 to figure it out. You can use secant as 1 over cos and cotangent as cos over sine and you can figure these all out. The nice thing about memorizing them is they're really connected or similar to the fact you know that tan squared plus 1 is secant squared. Look at the derivative of secant, it has secant and tan in it. You know that cotangent squared plus 1 is cosecant squared. The derivative of cosecant has a cotangent and a cosecant in it. So a little bit of connection there that might help you remember which ones go together. But again, for the most part, I don't memorize these. I always just switch it to cos and sine and quickly figure it out with the quotient rule and then go, oh yeah, that's what it was. And if I had to do a lot of them in a row, I'd do that first just so that I had it available. Okay? You want a bad chain rule? Well, we'll, we'll get one maybe after. This one's not bad. So if we use our new formulas, you can do it directly. Or you could change this to sine and cos and do it longer. And if you want a long chain rule, all six trig functions inside of each other. Why not? You could. Just keep hugging it. Yeah. yeah, that's where it gets a little bit messy because it's negative cosecant of this cotangent of that two different places. So that's a little bit messy at that point. Okay. You could rewrite this and rearrange it so that cosecant and secant happen earlier and then it's even worse. 